The evidence is overwhelming. The British state is spying on Muslims. Undercover police and security officers are infiltrating mosques, communities and homes and are aggressively seeking to entrap. My sister was five years old when her father was snatched away from her. If it wasn't because of these two undercover cops, we wouldn't have to go through this torture. But how does this covert infiltration work? What tactics are the police and MI5 using? It's always this push for information. Um, and yes, of course, we, we use recording devices, uh, which are often placed within a mosque and a, an environment of worship. I've been researching the Muslim community on and off for the past 15 years. I want to know if the police and MI5's tactics can ever be justified. Are they gratuitously targeting a whole community, or are they winning the war on terror? So we're on our way to Manchester from London to meet a Muslim family who were targeted by undercover police officers who pretended to be Muslims. At the end of around a year-long investigation, the head of the family, the father, was sent to jail for terrorism offences. This is the family home of Munir Farooqi, who was convicted of terrorism in 2011. He's currently serving an 18-year prison sentence after being found guilty of trying to recruit people to fight British soldiers in Afghanistan. Undercover policemen pretending to be Muslims spent a year frequenting this home, accepting the family's hospitality and asking them questions about Islam. But all the time they were wearing secret recording devices and were filming what was being said. He loves to do dawah, to tell people about Islam and to um, speak to a lot of non-Muslims and reverts and help them in every way possible. Um, he spent a lot of his free time uh, basically distributing free literature about Islam, uh, Quran in English translation, and um, helping as many people as you could in the community. The Quran is saying that we have all the answers. Challenge me, the Quran is saying. Really ask me the questions. We have all the answers in the Quran. He'd always go that extra mile um, to I don't know, fulfill whatever you need, not just for family members, but even people from outside the family, that was just part of his character's nature. Which, I mean, it was his warm-hearted hospitality that was used against him to frame him. Munir Faruqi can be seen here at his Manchester street stall spreading information about Islam. It's estimated that he converted around one person a week during the 10 years that he ran the stall. There were about three, four tables set. Um, that's where all the um, the literature was distributed to the non-Muslims and the Muslims. It's not really isolated from the, the rest of the community and it's pretty blatant what he was doing. There was nothing to shy away from and there was only one message which was preaching Islam which had nothing to do with terrorism. The officers, they pretended to show an interest in the Islam and within a month or two in their deployment, a bit after the regular visit to the house, they decided to embrace Islam. Uh, one embraced our, at our house and the other at the local mosque. And that's where the trust just grew. They were really intruding in, in, into privacy and into family life. So it would obviously upset me, but um, we, nobody actually even doubted the fact that they would be undercover officers. In this footage, Faruqi can be heard allegedly encouraging jihad against British soldiers in Afghanistan. We don't, you know, jihad is not just to go and give your life away, no. Uh, if we're going to go there, we'll make sure we get take at least you know, 40, 50 people with us. These remarks prove to be his downfall. But his family feel that he's the innocent victim of entrapment and will be released on appeal. And the manner of his conviction still leaves a bitter taste in their mouths. My sister was five years old when her father was snatched away from her. 
she has lost her childhood because of these two men. My daughter is growing up without her grandfather. I think it's pretty sick to, not just to pretend that you're a Muslim, but to pretend that you're part of any faith. It's not a crime against a person, it's a crime against God. Do you have problems now trusting other people because of what happened to you? Yeah, definitely. To the extent that even when we got raided, I, my husband, he's a, he's a new Muslim, he's English, and I couldn't even trust him because I thought maybe he's an undercover officer. After a four-month trial at Manchester Crown Court, Faruqi was convicted of preparing acts of terrorism, of soliciting to murder and of disseminating terrorist publications. The judge called him a very dangerous man, an extremist, a fundamentalist with a determination to fight abroad. But Manchester police didn't stop there. They've now applied to seize the family home of Munir Faruqi because they say his offences were committed there. The family and human rights groups say this is collective punishment and criminalization of innocent family members. The 9-11 attacks on the United States alerted Britain to the danger that so-called Islamic extremists might be planning to attack its own soil. And after the UK joined the US in invading and occupying two Muslim countries, Iraq and Afghanistan, that perceived threat only increased. At home, foreign nationals were targeted for detention without charge or trial, and kept in prison indefinitely. They were also targeted for deportation. Then the July 2005 London bombings realised the authorities' worst fears. The bombings were swiftly followed by draconian anti-terror legislation, which allowed for terror suspects, whether foreign or British, to be placed under house arrest on mere suspicion alone. In 2007, with UK troops still bogged down in Iraq and Afghanistan, the government came up with an anti-terror strategy called PREVENT, which mainly consisted of funding Muslim organisations to turn the community away from radicalisation. The idea was that so-called moderate Muslims, who weren't overly preoccupied with British foreign policy, would defeat the radicals in the court of Muslim opinion. But by common consent, prevent was a failure. Rizwan Sabir was arrested in 2008 after his university tipped off police that he was reading an Al-Qaeda manual. It later turned out that this was purely for legitimate PhD research. Until you actually address the systemic injustices that one is involved in uh, on a domestic front and on an in international front, the reason why people want to, to, to use maybe armed violence or, or, or armed action against the British state continues to flourish. With the advent of a new coalition government in 2010, Prevent was updated with a new emphasis on targeting young people at risk of radicalization. It also stressed the need to aggressively confront Islamist ideology. The government's prevent strategy is, is focused predominantly on countering ideas and ideology of what they consider to be the enemy, in this case Muslims who believe in um, a politicized form of Islam. What that essentially is, is it's a carte blanche approach for the state to go around uh, intercepting or investigating or scrutinizing anybody they so wish based on a series of, uh, of uh, indicators that the state has created. According to some estimates, at least 8,000 British Muslims are under surveillance, especially young people in schools, colleges and universities. Internet activity especially is being closely monitored. Community leaders are also being targeted because of the belief that they can control their followers. And women too are the focus of attention because of their perceived influence in the home. In 2010, hundreds of security cameras began appearing in the Sparkbrook and Washwood Heath areas of Birmingham. What did these areas have in common? Their residents were around 90% Muslim, of course. When the police were challenged over the cameras, they were very evasive and they pretended that it was a big scheme to combat traffic and antisocial behaviour. 
But then they were rumbled, and it emerged that money for the cameras had come from a counter-terrorism fund, and the intention was to target the Muslim community as a whole. And we discovered that the position of these cameras formed a ring around two uh, Muslim communities, and it seemed to be not about community safety or untaxed vehicles or antisocial behaviour, which is what we were told when we asked. Uh, it very much looked like it was about spying on Muslims. Birmingham resident Steve Jolly ran a campaign to uncover the truth about the cameras in the face of police denials and stonewalling. But eventually his tenacity bore fruit. The police admitted they had misled, apologised and took down the cameras. It was a pretty amazing outcome because a lot of people said you'll, you'll never achieve those objectives. You, know, yeah. you can't take on the police and the government, particularly if it's national security. Yeah. And so even my fellow campaigners were, were doubtful that we would win, but we did. You're not going to get uh, the community to talk to you if you declare that everyone is a suspect. Are the police still spying on Birmingham Muslims now? I believe so. Um, I just don't think they'll do it in the same way. They won't, they won't get caught out this time. The spy camera scandal has left a bit of taste in the mouths of Muslims in Birmingham. The cameras themselves may well have been taken away, but the suspicion still remains that the community is being spied upon, victimised and targeted. It's a bit of an intrusion on your privacy. Um, you feared it. Um, you know, you don't see special circumstances for other communities in regards to that. You know, you do feel a little bit branded, but, you know, there's two ways to it. And as long as you're not doing anything, I don't feel you really have anything to worry about yourselves. We must definitely live in Big Brother State. But ultimately, as ordinary citizens, there's not a lot of power you have. You know, this, this kind of like camouflage of choice or power the individual has is it's all an illusion. But despite the controversy, Birmingham Central Mosque says that relations with the police are still good and that the Muslim community is overwhelmingly peaceful and law-abiding. The mosque does not believe that Muslims are being targeted. They are targeting the extremist people in all communities, people who want to create problems. So if the police comes inside this mosque yeah. and places spies inside this mosque, yeah. places cameras inside these mosques, acts with deception and subterfuge, you have no problem with that? Well, ac acting with uh, sort of uh, deception and sort of, uh, subterfuge, I would have a problem with that uh, because I'm absolutely open if the police wants to come and um, talk to us about anything, we, we are here. It's clear though that many Muslims in Birmingham, and especially the youth, believe the Birmingham mosque leaders are out of touch. It's left a, a, a stain and a pain in the community here. It's going to take many years for the community here, not just the Muslim community, but the entire community to be able to bring that trust back into the policing. We were just in Birmingham mosque now, and the mosque treasury spokesman said, so ultimately if you've got nothing to hide, you don't have to worry about. I think that's a lame answer to, to give. If you want to fit 270, 80 cameras around Birmingham and a lot of them uh, hidden overt cameras, then they need to be in public and spread across the entire of Birmingham. Otherwise, we want them down. We're learning more and more about covert police surveillance of the Muslim community, but we haven't got the full picture yet. In fact, far from it. But we do know that it's probably modelled on US surveillance of so-called dissident groups over the past few decades and indeed British surveillance of similar groups during the same time period. So I've come here to a small bookshop tucked away in an East London side street to meet a guy who knows how it all works. Activist Andy Meinker says he's been targeted by the police over many years because of his work with the environmental movement. This includes being followed by police at demonstrations and harassment at his home and workplace. You'll get things like you'll, you'll pulled over and searched and <clears throat> someone will say to me, um, um, give us your name and address. And I'll say, um, well, there's no legal power in this country um, to demand name and address in the street. And they say, oh, go on, Andy, you're going to tell us. You live at 43 Chaucer Road, aren't you? They know everything about uh, hundreds of people. They have a database of, of literally about 15,000 protesters in, in the uh, radical 
radical left. Two people that I would have regarded as close friends later turned out to be police officers, uh, Mark Kennedy and Jim Sutton. I would have completely trusted them. I, I told them lots of personal things about, about my life and I think, frankly, knowing um, other of my friends uh, who have actually had um, relationships with them that I got off very lightly. Micah says that the police and MI5 are deliberately exaggerating the threat of terrorism because of huge government resources which are there to be won. The Muslim community is the obvious target. This shop is based in Whitechapel, which has a, a, a very high Muslim population, and we, just walking the streets, see every day the regular harassment of young Muslims. And that is having a devastating effect on, on those people's confidence in, 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 in how society works. And the government and the, the state, big business, genuinely doesn't want those problems solved. They're quite happy with, with this kind of high-tension situation because it's, at the end of the day, a money-making business. Many believe that British police tactics are based on the American COINTELPRO program, a series of covert FBI projects aimed at monitoring, infiltrating, discrediting and disrupting political organisations. The Communist Party of the United States is a fifth column if there ever was one. They are seeking to weaken America just as they did in their era of, of obstruction when they were aligned with the Nazis. Their goal is the overthrow of our government. Allegedly, tactics included discrediting targets through psychological warfare, smearing individuals in the media, harassment, wrongful imprisonment and illegal violence, including assassination. Targets included communists, the civil rights movement and other so-called subversives. All in the name of protecting national security, preventing violence and maintaining social and political order. After September the 11th, COINTELPRO tactics were transferred to the Muslim community. The New York Police Department's counter-terrorism efforts focused on spying on Muslim neighborhoods, infiltrating Muslim-owned businesses and cataloging mosques. More than a dozen colleges in the Northeast were a focus of the program, which would monitor websites and Muslim student associations. Former Guantanamo Bay detainee Moazem Beg believes those tactics have been transferred to the UK. These individuals, these agents provocateurs in particular, were coming into the community and talking about and asking young um, impressionable individuals, perhaps, uh, perhaps things about would you like to go to Afghanistan, what do you think we should do in, in Iraq, what do you think is the best way to respond to all of these things, don't you think that Islam says we should fight jihad against the enemy and so forth, and putting into the minds of these people, these individuals, uh, ideas uh, that they wouldn't have had they not come across these, the, these men, these provocateurs. In the United Kingdom and elsewhere, they have a plethora of anti-terrorist legislation. They already can hold people without charge or trial. They haven't done so for decades on end. They have laws the likes of which they've never had, even at the height of the IRA campaign, when they were bombing right across the United Kingdom. Uh, so the arguments that this is all in the, uh, in, the, in the interests of national security simply don't wash. Shahib Sher admits to being an MI5 spy between 2000 and 2003. A former youth worker, he says he was blackmailed and threatened into spying on Muslim leaders and youth in the northern English city of Bradford. This involved planting bugs in mosques, secretly recording conversations and encouraging talk of jihad in an attempt to entrap. Occupying a position of responsibility within the community, um, there's a, an access to that community. It was impossible to say no to them. They blackmail, you know, for, for financial reasons. Um, they, they blackmail with threats of uh, imprisonment, incarceration. Um, they uh, allude to um, your own personal health. Cher says he doesn't know what was done with the information he passed on, but that it was probably used to blackmail others. He says he deeply regrets this now. I do very much feel that I've uh, betrayed my community, um, not least because this was the community that um, provided the, the, the home and the environment to support uh, our family um, from when we first arrived in this country. Aside from combating terrorism, MI5's intention, according to some academics, is to divide the Muslim community against each other and prevent a united voice emerging. 
And disturbingly, Shahib Sher says MI5 spying isn't simply a one-way street. He believes that many Muslim leaders are in fact MI5 assets, who've sold the community out for financial and other reasons. If you are fighting on point of principle and, and, and reason, um, then I think it's very important to keep a clear boundary between who your partners are and who you partner with. Negotiation, discussion and communication is very important, especially between two warring sides or two sides that are at opposite ends of the spectrum. But, but kind of fighting one day and then, and then becoming best friends the next day, it just shows a hypocrisy. Shahib Sher says he's sure that MI5 is still spying on Bradford's Muslims. In fact, he thinks the spying has increased over the last decade. He says his own contact with MI5 stopped abruptly in 2003, but resumed seven years later when he was summoned to a police station under false pretenses. This time, however, the attention wasn't welcome. Deeply ashamed and guilt-ridden over his previous role, he's now made a complaint against MI5 for threats, blackmail and harassment. But he's not hopeful of a positive result, as he says the security services are nearly untouchable. Should we draw a red line as a community, no contact with the security services? Absolutely. Um, we must be very firm with this because what essentially we have here is an organisation that is unregulated, unscrutinised, with no um, oversight at present from um, a parliamentary committee. The, the best option, I feel, is to have some kind of a, a community consensus and a community avenue where the community leaders can address these things collectively in concert. But the community is very divided, isn't it? Yes. The MI5 building in London is only a short walk from Parliament, although few passers-by would have any clue about what exactly goes on behind these walls. We certainly attracted suspicion when we started filming outside. Two policemen checked our identities before allowing us to continue. It would probably have been a lot worse if we'd entered the building itself. But just for the record, and even though they wouldn't say it to me, MI5 does deny harassing Muslims. On its website, it says it doesn't investigate any group or individual on the grounds of ethnicity or religious belief. And it says it only carries out investigations if there's a clear national security reason for doing so. MI5 then goes on to say that its main area of work is focused on countering the threat of extremist groups like Al-Qaeda, who commit terrorist attacks. So the police and MI5 stand accused of spying, infiltrating, disrupting and entrapping. Serious accusations, you might think. Now, MI5 don't make public statements, but you would have thought the police might want to rebut those accusations, to call them ridiculous. Well, I contacted them, they didn't even bother replying. But I still wanted to understand how it works from a police perspective. So I went to meet former London commander Ali Desai, once perhaps the most prominent Muslim police officer in the country, but also the subject of MI5 surveillance. If there is any threat to the national security of this country, there will be a need to carry out some level of surveillance. However, the key word in all of this is proportionality. Uh, just because you have a, a, a fine grain of intelligence which says someone may be a, a threat to national security, that does not give you a license to carry out phone taps, intrusive surveillance, tracker surveillance and, and, and everything else. Desai says that some police MI5 tactics are clearly unethical. And he believes the power to decide who gets investigated by undercover officers and who doesn't should be decided by a judge and not by the police itself. Any profiling of any community, particularly the Muslim community or, or, or who, whoever, it has to be based on real substantive intelligence and not on the basis of innuendos and, and, and just uh, you know, insubstantive belief that just because someone is Muslim and goes to Pakistan is likely to be a terrorist threat. It seems pretty clear that the authorities aren't listening to the concerns of the Muslim community. So in all likelihood, the spying, infiltration, entrapment and disruption will continue. But where does that leave the average Muslim who might fall victim to these tactics? Does he or she have any redress? 
or does the community have to play the role of passive victim? One can have an impact on policy if we have ideas, if we have views um, and writings and ideas. We need to set up institutions and organisations that are responsible for trying to coordinate some coherent response for the Muslim community. But the problem with the Muslim community is that there's so many rivalries and factions and internal disputes that we can't unite on one front. They may be watching us, but we watch them right back. We may think that they're not on our side, but it doesn't matter because it's been documented. And once somebody knows they're being watched, just like us, uh, they become much more careful. I've been looking at counter-terrorism policy since 9-11, so I did know the Muslim community were being monitored. But what I found out during the course of this documentary has truly shocked me. Yes, there is a threat from so-called Muslim terrorism, but actually that threat is quite small. But the resources thrown at that threat are completely disproportionate. The result is the Muslim community feels stigmatized and targeted. Yes, the authorities might catch a few bad guys, but what they lose in return in terms of public confidence far outweighs any gains that they've made.